What time is it? It's time for another Every Other Wednesday. Welcome to okay. Every Other Wednesday, where we get together every other Wednesday and talk about organizational culture issues and how we can help and grow and learn from one another. Um, my name is Sanjay Nath. I am based just outside of Toronto, where I specialize in helping individuals and organizations deal with performance and leadership. Michael Kerr. And you do that brilliantly well, I might well, add, Sanjay. Well, I'm you. actually going to pay you a compliment right at the top of the show, in case wow. I don't do it again, in case Weird. things go sideways. Uh, and my name is Michael Kerr. I'm not in my usual location, Canmore, Alberta. I speak about inspiring workplace cultures, inspiring leadership, and humor in the workplace, I speak a lot about. And we talk a lot on the program about the need for life balance, for taking a break from work. So that is what I'm doing right now. I had the chance to do a presentation, to speak, to do a keynote in beautiful Costa Rica, one of my favorite country, favoritest countries in the world. So we decided to add a month after my keynote. Uh, so we're down here for a little while, my lovely wife and myself. Right now, uh, it's our third time in Costa Rica. Right now we are in a little beachside, funky little bohemian town called uh, Montezuma, population about 300 people. We're at this beautiful place here. I'll give you a little, I'll give you a little glimpse of, this is the view from our little beach cabana here. Can you see that, Sanjay? I, I do see that, it's beautiful. Uh, I do want to point out a couple of things. Uh, someone mentioned that you kind of look like you're on a survivor and uh, he is actually on survivor. He was the first one voted off, no surprise there. The other thing I want to point out is, so you did a keynote for an hour and you're taking a month vacation. That kind of sums up your uh, your working career there. So. That, that's my work ethic, Sanjay. That's the ratio I like to work. One hour of work and then a month off. That's uh, that's pretty much how I like to roll. Perfect. Un, uh, unable to join us today are our two partners in crime, Jeff Toe uh, and, and Richard Haddon. Actually, very small, quick, funny story about Richard. So two weeks ago, I was able to join from, um, from a hotel room in, where was that, Kansas City, speaking. And crazy coincidence, that day, Richard was also speaking in Kansas City. So we actually got together and had dinner at Jack Stack's, which is a famous barbecue place there. So it, it is a small world. Anyways, let's kind of launch into, launch into today's program. We're going to do a, a little bit of a, mish, a mishmash. Uh, one of the things we did want to talk about was sort of leading with compassion in the workplace. Oh, sorry. There... I, my my doorbell just went, and I I apologize. For, I know this is rude. Some people you really have, have to no get it decorum. down. Don't you don't you put up? I put up a sign when I'm at home. Do not and, ring the doorbell. I've got oh. important things to do. Anyways, give me a second. One sec. One sec. One Sunday, second. Sunday. Okay, I'll just I'll just talk amongst myself. How's everyone doing? Uh, it's lovely. It's 32 degrees here today. We went for a beautiful hike down the beach. I uh, got up at five this morning to do this. Episode. It was just the FedEx guy. It was just oh, the God, FedEx good. guy. Oh God, thanks. Thank you goodness, know. just the FedEx guy. Good. Welcome back, yeah, Sunday. So, it's good to see you. Yeah. So you okay. Were, good. Well, all, all great to be, uh, to be, uh, to see you again, Michael. And uh, wait, wait yeah, a minute. So, wait, wait. I gotta put my glasses. What the? What the heck is going on? Oh, it's look at you. It's so here Richard. What is, here we are. Here we are. Oh. This is like yeah. when a special when a special celebrity shows up on the Tonight Show or something. Ah, uh, the old switcheroo. Yeah. Plot old twist. switcheroo. <laughs> Plot twist. Yeah. No, I um, just as luck would have it, uh, Sanjay and I find ourselves in the same city a lot these days, and so <laughs> this is actually the third this time. is the third time in about a month. Yeah, in, in wow. about six about weeks. A, yeah, it, that, that we've seen. Wow. But Richard has a flight in four hours. Right. So uh, we were able to oh, do so this. So we should we should speed this up. Uh, exactly. Right. Talk a little faster. Anyway, you're looking good, me. Richard. It's about good to see you. And empathy today. What a nice surprise! I'm jealous. You know what? Actually, well, not, not you're in jealous. Costa Rica and you're jealous. Yeah, no, I, just I'm not, I, I thought about it for a second. And no, <laughs> no, not, not really. that jealous. And think about it. Richard gets to hang out with me. You're jealous of that, right? That's right. Yeah, I know. Yeah, no. Yeah. OK, these people so are talking about, compassion. Stuff about empathy and compassion. So what do you think? Well, we kind of a lot of times when we put together these shows uh, and as you can tell, we spend hours and weeks and sometimes years rehearsing and practicing. Um, we often base them on articles. And there's this article that we kind of shared around and, and kind of discussed and argued a bit about. But one of the things I really liked about this article is, is they decide or they define the difference between empathy and compassion. And I actually really liked the, uh, the definition. They said, what was that? They said that basically 
compassion is empathy plus action. And, and so I, I, I really like that because, you know, it's nice to be empathetic with someone and saying, hey, you know what, that sucks. I, I, I feel for you and, and have that true empathy and be that empath. But to take it to the next level, to kind of actually act on some of that and help them and support them and help them move forward. That's when we all of a sudden get into this, this compassion piece. So how does compassion work in the workplace? I mean, some people would say compassion really has no place uh, in the workplace. Yeah. And, and I mean, some people would say organizational culture has no place right. in the workplace too. And I mean, obviously we're preaching to the converted here, but this idea of the whole body experience of looking at someone beyond being an employee, beyond putting this widget into that widget uh, and looking at them as a complex being, make them feel value and, and wanted. It actually, and again, this article goes on to talk about how passion is the, is the foundation for building loyalty. And they talk about that in this day and age, we don't actually have um, an employment problem. We have a lack of loyalty problem. So even right now, as unemployment is kind of rising a bit and economics are uncertain and we're talking about the recession, people are still leaving their jobs and they're leaving jobs not because they want to go into this economic uncertainty. They're leaving them because they don't feel valued. They leave right. them because they don't feel the compassion, they don't feel the connection, and they don't have the loyalty. Yeah. yeah. And I, I loved how this, the research focused on not just the health benefits of demonstrating compassion for us all, which is obviously really important, I think, but as you say, Sanjay, the impact on workplace culture and, and emphasizing relationships over transactional uh, transactional events in the workplace and how it's because of relationships, first and foremost, that employees are leaving us. And how, as you say, compassion is all about implementing something. It's about action, putting that empathy into action, but it's really at the heart of it, recognizing the importance of relationships, that everything starts mm -hmm. with relationships in the workplace. When we talk about culture, when we talk about trust, open and honest communication, people feeling like they have a sense of belonging and feel valued, we have to make sure everyone, I think, not just the senior leaders, everybody is putting that compassion into action on a regular basis. So how do you, how do you put compassion into action? Or how do you put empathy into action, which then results in compassion? Well, the first thing I would do is I would attend every other Wednesday, every other Wednesday and yeah. tell all your friends and come in droves. So, I mean, like, but that's like breathing. You just, it's automatically understood. Right. Uh, and, and again, the, the, the article goes on and gives some specific strategies on, on how to do that. And a lot of them are very sort of common sense approaches. But of the, of the ideas, the one that really stuck out to me was, you know, when you're trying to engage people, mm -hmm. especially when you're looking to help them, they said, try to get away from yes, no questions and ask more open-ended questions. So do you need help? Is very, it's a very different question and it places a very different reaction than how can I help? Or what can I specifically do for you right now to lower your stress? Or how can I make your day better? Or mm -hmm. whatever. So getting away from the very directive, especially to if we're stressed and you know we're freaking out, we just have a tendency to go, no, yes, leave me alone. No, and we want to bury our heads in the sand. So if, if we can be led more with, with the more appropriate question, mm -hmm. we're able to uh, zone in and open it up. Like, actually, I'll give you a quick example. And these guys, well, I'm sure can relate to. If you're in front of an audience as a speaker and you go, I need a volunteer. Depending on the group, sometimes you're great. You get volunteers. Sometimes you get crickets, right? And crickets can be good volunteers sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. especially Jiminy Cricket. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you can have, that's, that's a way of asking questions. I need a volunteer. And again, it might work. But I found that if I'm in a group that's very passive or not into it at all, or you know, very quiet, shy, reserved, I won't ask that question. But if I do need a volunteer, I will pose the question differently. And I'll say something like, I need a volunteer who has her birthday in an odd month, has at least two children and grew up with an older sister. And all of a sudden people by just changing- That would actually be me. There you go. Yeah. And would you volunteer? Sure. Yeah. Because I mean, you just hit every, every point from it. But my, my point is by changing the question and not keeping it so easy to reject and making it more specific to the person, it actually shows a connection. It's, it's a form okay. of, of coming closer together. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. And it, 
point taken, Sanjay. That's that's it's incredibly important, right? To think about how we ask our questions. And, uh, yeah. To, to, and uh, you know, as as is often the case, Carol has brought up an interesting uh, point, an interesting question. She says, "Interesting how things have changed over the decades." It's hard to imagine someone in the 1930s leaving a job because they didn't feel valued. They were working because they needed to put food on the table. I was having a conversation just last week about this. I spoke for, a, for an association and they, although this is not my specialty particularly to do an entire keynote, they asked me to do it and I did. And it was on attracting and retaining younger workers. And, and, and I did quite a lot of, of thinking uh, and, and research on this. And I, I opened by telling the story of my great grandfather who was born 150 years ago in 1873 in a tiny little village in Georgia. He was a pecan farmer all his life. He had 10 children, you know, all of this. And then I compared him to my daughter, who is 34 years old. And I said, you know, if you were to ask Solomon Cobble and Lindsay Haddon what they want out of work, I think you'd get pretty much the same answers. You know, they, they, yeah, they need to make an income, but they also want to do something that's important. They want to do something where they feel like they're having an impact. They want to learn something. They want to get better at stuff. But the context in which we provide what people need is what has changed. I don't think what people want and what people need has is, is changed. I don't think any of us wants to go back to the 1930s. I think you're absolutely right, Carol. People would, they would never even consider, you know, whether or not I feel valued and all of these other kind of what we call higher order needs. But this is not the 1930s. And I think what we have to do now, especially in a competitive labor market, is to say, what is it that we can do that's going to really, uh, you know, attract the best, keep the best, and make the best people productive in what we yeah. do? You know, to that point. So, so oh, sorry, I want to ramble on a bit of the, about that. Um, I, I read something years ago talking about different demographics and they said, you know, the veteran, the veteran generation, they, you know, did the same job, didn't complain for 35 years. They got their watch, retired and went off to the sunset. Then the boomers, they did the same job for 35 years, but they did complain and they were a little grumpy. And, and, you know, after 35 years, they got their job. The Gen Xers, they were, you know, a little, uh, a little, little feistier. They're going to talk back. They're going to be a little more defiant, but for the most part, pretty loyal, maybe switched careers a few times. The Gen Ys are gonna switch careers 18 times. And the millennials, they like, you look at them weird and they quit their job on principle and they go live in their in their parents' basement. And so, and they have the luxury to do that. And, and again, to, to it's the- a very different world today. Uh, absolutely, but to your point, the values don't change, only the way they manifest. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And, yeah. and so, so um, I, I, I'm reminded of this, when I first started speaking, I, I spoke to a whole bunch of schools and someone would ask me, what's the difference between speaking at a rural school in Saskatchewan and a downtown Manhattan school? And, and I- One is colder and one in Saskatchewan. It depends time of the year. Uh, All right. Um, and and I, what I would say is, the issues remain the same, but how they manifest yeah, change. Exactly. So it's about fitting in. It's about finding your identity. It's about, you know, but in one, and I'm being a little stereotypical when I say this, but in one um, region, it's you need the newest tractor to fit in. Yeah. And yeah. the other one is you need the newest, you know, the $300 phone. Yeah. Right. Or the phone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and I would add to this, you know, this, this discussion about things changing over the decades and, being being relevant today, I would I would add that I think it's even more relevant in those positions that don't necessarily have a lot of perceived connection to a a, a great sense of purpose or meaning. Yeah. So, for lack of a better term, the the muck jobs that we talk about, the lower paying jobs where people tend to just be treated as widgets, disposable, yeah. interchangeable. I think especially in those jobs, the more the supervisors, the more the managers can build a culture and can lead with compassion, the greater the impact is going to be for those kind of jobs, even more so than a lot of other jobs. But I want to get to a question for both of you wise gentlemen and to okay. our, our, our chat folks here today. Compassion is, again, one of those terms that a lot of people would consider one of those loosey-goosey, soft, intangible kind of mushy things. So... The obvious question becomes, is it possible to hire for compassion? Like, can we hire candidates? Is there a way to hire candidates for this trait? And can we train people for compassion? If it is just that important, 
to the health of our culture if we know, as all the research suggests, it has a huge impact on employee absenteeism rates, presenteeism rates, employee turnover, health, resiliency, all this stuff. Can we hire and train for compassion? Yes-ish. I mean, yes like anything else. I like yeah, that. It, yes, this is. It, it's Maybe. The whole, it's the whole nature versus nurture argument, right? Yeah. Like there are people who are just innately more empathetic. Right. They mm -hmm. just they can smell empathy. They, they walk into a room and they're like, oh, you had a you had a fight with your significant other or, uh, oh, you, you're what's wrong with your dog. They just know they have what call it intuition, call it whatever you want. There are people who are just hardwired differently. Fair enough. But there are people who necessarily don't have it to that degree, but they are open to learning. And those people are trainable. But the people who cross their arms and go uh, this this is crap. This is mushy. I don't, I didn't sign up for this. They're not trainable. Uh, and I think, the, but he, if this is the point we brought up many times is it has to fit regardless of whether you're trying to train these people to, to be more compassionate or you're bringing them in compassionately and you're hiring for that. It has to fit with the organizational overview. Yeah. Because if you're a cutthroat, you know, uh, cheat the next guy to step on their face to get a step ahead, like, if that's your culture and then you read an article right. or you attended EOW and they said, oh, be compassionate and you slap it on the side of the organization and add a line to the mission statement that says, and we're compassionate. Yeah, it's it gotta be natural. It's gotta be natural. I, I'll never forget. This has been about mm, 10, 12 years ago. And I was working with a, a company and I won't name the company, but it was a fast food company. So Michael, to your, you know, to your example, people who, you know, are they're not, not highly paid, although, these days in fast food is pretty good, right? But they're they're not re relatively highly paid, and they may not see that their you know that their job uh, you know is is saving the world from you know some some awful fate and something. So they might not see that the impact of their work you know all of those things that we talk about being intrinsic value in in the workplace. And this this company was going into a new market, a new area of the country uh, where the people were not familiar with them. But it's a very compassionate company and one that really has a compassionate culture. And I remember seeing the CEO standing in front of a group of people who were going to be taking over the management of these new stores that they were building in, in the Midwestern part of the United States. And he said, if you have an employee who's experiencing a personal issue, a personal problem, something's happening in their life, he said, we want you to go above and beyond for that employee. When you do, he said, and I'll never forget his words, he said, you will have their full attention when you talk about going above and beyond for our customers. Yeah. And I just thought that was brilliant, the way that, that, that he you know, connected those two. And so I think we can say that some organizations have a culture of empathy. And I agree with, was it Shelby who said, you can probably train for empathy more than, and compassion more than you can hire for it, but I think people will know when you, if they're, you know, uh, considering coming to work for an organization, is this an organization with a culture of compassion or, or is it not? And if, if you are that way, then you're going to be attracted to that company. And if you're not, you probably aren't. And, and I also yeah. think that passion or compassion breeds compassion. Yeah, exactly. And empathy yeah. breeds uh, empathy and loyalty breeds loyalty. Mm -hmm. And so, so mm -hmm. if someone comes in and they're not compassionate and it's a very compassionate organization, I think one of two things happen. Either they kind of warm up to the idea and they be start becoming more compassionate because birds of a feather, or they go, this is garbage. I don't want <laughs> what I signed up for. Yeah. And you get natural attrition. Sure. Yeah. And, and one of the points that Jeremy made in the chat was that with the advent of remote and hybrid work, that it, it's, it is, I think it has called out the need for connection, personal connection uh, more than, than ever before. I, and what he actually says, let's, I don't know how to work Sanjay's computer. Um, what was the first? Yeah, Team, Team Zoom has changed a lot of things for the better, but it's also alienated those who need the personal, interpersonal interaction. He actually says something above that that's even better. The more technology separates us, the more the need for empathy and compassion to help make up for the lack of personal connections. One of the very first things that I started saying when, when COVID first, first happened, and, and that's why I like what Jeremy said so much, you know, I said, this virus has, has brought people, has separated people. The leader's job is to bring people together, whether that's physic physically, don't take that the wrong way, but in, in the right, you know, in the same physical uh, space or in other ways. 
So a group I was speaking for today, there was someone in the group who was absolutely so adamantly against remote work because it's just all, he just had all of these, uh, all he focused on all of the negatives of remote and hybrid work. And I said, I don't have a vested interest in this one way or the other. For me, it is if you can find enough people willing to work under your rules, fine. If not, you, you probably need to change the rules. It just makes sense to me. But he was saying, well, you know, if, if, if all of our people, that our managers are going to have to learn how, he kept using the word, learn. our managers are going to have to learn how to communicate differently. They're going to have to learn. And he finally kind of went, hmm, maybe I'm making my own point here that, yeah, <laughs> when things like that happen, when people are not in the same environment they were before, it requires new skills on the part of the employees, but it also requires new skills on the part of leaders. And yeah. one of those skills is an increased level of, of emotional intelligence and the ability to understand, communicate, and to engage your own empathetic response to the and, people you work with, if you want to get the most out of them. Right, and 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 two of the things that the research emphasized that we haven't really touched on it, well, we kind of have without saying it. One is the need for, obviously, for the compassion to be authentic, to be sincere. It's really, you, you know, you can try faking this, but that'll only get you so far. And the other interesting Prosthetic finding- Prosthetic tears, yes. Yeah, yeah, fake tears. Hollywood tears. And the other finding was that we're talking about compassion for the sake of being compassionate as opposed to using compassion strategically or manipulatively in order to get ahead, right? We, so this is did. gonna help me get ahead. So I'm gonna pretend to be nice. I'm gonna bring in cookies every day because this will help me. You know, people hey. think I'm great and nice and this will help me succeed. What the research clearly shows is People really do succeed as leaders if they are compassionate, but it has to come from a genuine place and not a place of doing it for uh, ulterior motives. With that said, uh, yeah, I found that a really interesting part of the research there that they said, yeah, if you do fake it, you don't get further ahead. If you legitimately are compassionate, you end up making more money. They talked about a survey they took, uh, what was it, 300 uh, uh, kindergarten kids, followed them for 30 years, and they the ones that they deemed to be more compassionate 30 years later were making more money and healthy relationships and all that other fun stuff. But the, the research went on to say that, yeah, if you fake it or not, if you fake it, but if you do it for solely the reason of getting ahead, you don't actually get the benefit, which to me is, is, is very interesting. It, it kind of goes back to that old age of uh, adage of, do you, is it better to give to charity for the wrong reasons or not to give to charity? And, and I actually go, but even if you have to do it for the wrong reasons, Maybe you don't get the benefit, but the people around you do. Yeah. So I'd right. rather see people doing it uh, for the wrong reasons than not doing it at all for, for whatever yeah. that's worth. The, the other thing too is, I mean, whether we're talking about COVID or Jeremy had mentioned this idea of technology dividing us, but I always believe that there's two sides to the coin. And I agree technology has divided us, but I also agree that technology has brought us together. Yeah. I mean, if you look at airlines or telephones or, you know, soon to come out, uh, what, what zapping machine or are we teleporting? I'm sure that they'll oh, be around. Is that coming out soon? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, look, just I mean, it, 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 it's, it's ironic. Here, the three of us are uh, you are in Costa Rica, you are at home in Canada, I'm in Canada, You're but foreign. I live in the United States, foreign. and we're all having a conversation with people. And I know that we have at least one person from the UK on our call today, and uh, many from Canada and from other parts of the US. Uh, and, and this has been enabled by technology. So we wouldn't even be able to have those things otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, and just think for a moment about just, just, we're talking about really simple stuff too, as yeah. the research shows, yeah. right? It's the small, simple stuff. It's, it's just taking a few moments to demonstrate that you care about somebody as a human being, asking the right questions. And so technology doesn't necessarily take that away. I'm thinking about some, some horrific bosses that I've had in the past who just would start a meeting, would come into a meeting late with no social skills, no emotional intelligence, not ask how any, you know, we might have a staff member there who had just lost their dog on the weekend, no acknowledgement of that. And technology isn't going to be any different in that situation, right? We could no. come on a Zoom meeting with that same boss and he's yeah. gonna be this abrupt jerk with no social skills who doesn't take the time to check in with people so whether you're you're remotely on Zoom or in person, those things 
a lot of them stay the same, right? It, it, it reminds me, you know, I'm, I'm an analogy guy. Um, I just think about money. Money is a great amplifier, right? So if someone, someone who goes, oh, I would save more money if I made more money. No, you wouldn't. If you don't save now and you're making a little money, when you make more money, you'll just spend more. Um, if you're a jerk and you get money, you just be a bigger jerk. A rich jerk. Um, you'd yeah. be a rich jerk. If you're a narcissist and you have uh, and you have a little money, you you know, and, and you get more money, it just amplifies. I, I believe the same thing's true about technology. So to your point there, Michael, that if a boss is a jackass in person and you put him online, he's amplified because he can be a jackass in many, many locations now. So <laughs> he I, can I, spread I, his jackass he, he around the world. Can. And, and I think that sometimes she. we forget that. We think that technology is this cure or it's this fix them. It's not. It's, it's an amplification of the root of what's there. So if you have a healthy culture and you go online, you can amplify it and go better and bigger with it. And if you have a toxic culture and you go online, you can, you know, yeah, you can just increase that. Yeah. yeah. You know, there, there's a there's a guy talking about compassion. Um, there, there's a guy I know. He's a speaker and, and some some of the people in the audience, you guys may know him. Is, it, him. is his name Mike Kerr? No, it's not. It, it's not it, yes. even, nor is it Jeff Tobe or Richard Hatton, but it's Marcus Engel. Uh, Marcus Engel was in a horrific automobile accident. I think he was 18 years old. Um, he was blinded and his entire face was crushed. And he spent literally, I think he had dozens of surgeries in hospitals. And he has gone on now to write and speak about the idea of compassionate caring. And I love his definition of compassion uh, when, when he says that it is the feeling or the ability to relate to the suffering of another person combined with the desire to improve it. So, you know, I mean, I think the empathy is, yeah, we can relate to that, but then just like this body of work that we've been looking at adds a further definition to say that it's, it's empathy plus action is, is compassion. And so what he's saying is that it's not only empathizing with people, but having a desire to somehow make it better, whether it be through what you can actually do materially for it or simply commiserating, just simply allowing people to express their feelings and so forth. Right. And again, you, you will get people who will say, but that's not what business is about. We're here to make money, blah, 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 blah. But if you look at how people respond, I don't know anyone who doesn't respond positively to a compassionate leader. Right. And, and compassion usually has a story behind it. Yes. And that's one of the things is, as human beings, we're attracted to a story. I mean, if you look at the greatest marketing campaigns, there are, are we story-based? Why are movies successful? They're story-based, right? So that's how we, we draw people, uh, how we connect with them is, is the story. Because your story is similar to mine or uh, that it, it excites an emotion within me and, and I'm drawn into it. Um, so given the, the, we're kind of, you know, starting to wind this thing down and let's go through in the article, they actually talk about seven ways, uh, evidence-based ways managers can improve their compassion skills. So, okay. let's, so this gets to the question, can you train, can you train for compassion? Yeah. And I, I was, let's I was gonna... that we have hired for compassion or that we've just been lucky and the people we have yeah. hired are capable and, and of that. Richard, your, your definition that you gave too. Um, from that speaker, again, that makes me believe just that focus on action, right? I, I yeah. vehemently agree, agree or think that sort of, my, my brain is a little Costa Rican fried. That's my excuse. Um, it, it normally is. I've only been speaking to monkeys for about a week here. Uh, well, where was I going with this? Yes, <laughs> sorry. So if we know that the key element here is action, that's one of the ways I think that this is actually highly trainable. Yeah. You can, first of all, sell the benefits of it, sell the real world economic benefits of creating a compassionate culture. But then we know since it takes action, I think a lot of leaders just, they, they don't know, they've never been trained on this. And you need to, for some people, just spell it out really simply. Here is a whole uh, kit, here is a whole shopping list of ideas of simple things that you can do to turn empathy into action and build a more compassionate team and be a more compassionate leader. So I think it's highly trainable. So on that note, Sanjay, are you gonna share the- um... Sure, first one is, it says start small. What does Simple that mean? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it, you don't have to change it overnight. You can do little things. In fact, they even talk about 
Uh, sometimes people are too busy or they claim to be too busy. And again, the research is showing that in 40 seconds or less, you can actually make a difference. So sometimes it's as simple as, hey, how's your dog? Or, you know, oh, knowing something, their child did this, their significant other, there's something they're working on. Hey, I heard you were at a judo competition last weekend. How did that go? Right. It's just it's just a way of, of making an effort to show that their life matters. Yeah. And and again, this is based on authenticity. If you don't care about the judo competition, don't ask because it was a checkbox. How was the judo competition? Because in as fact, you glance at your smartphone every five seconds, right, and, and roll your eyes when. It, so if you aren't doing it truly and authentically, it will actually alienate and has the opposite effect of what you're trying to do. And the second thing on the list was to be thankful. So to be thankful for what you for what you've got for uh, for good news. I you know I'm I uh, have a group of people that I meet with frequently. And we start every one of our meetings with let's go, let's have good news. Let's just go around the Zoom room and share good news. I think when we're when we're cognizant of the things that we do have to be thankful for, and we voice that 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 enables us to be more compassionate. Yep. So being thankful. The next thing says be purposeful. I, to me, I I interpret that as be intentional about it. So sometimes, especially if you're not a particularly compassionate person by nature but you recognize the benefits of it, then I think you're going to be a little bit more intentional uh, about it. So to actually go back to your point that Mike, you were making, creating that boss that is all business and doesn't care about, you know, all these other things that are going on. If you have a, a purpose, uh, even if it's just a template to begin with, and it says, hey, we'll get to the business, but before we get to the business, can we do a little check-in? Can we talk about, uh, an item in the news or something that's, that's, you know, um, social or, or that's relevant to you. And again, it has to be real. If you don't care about the person's dog, don't ask about the dog. Um, and, but, but there's gotta be some common ground. If you're drawing a Venn diagram, there's some overlapping bit. It can do with interest rates. It can do with your sports teams. It can do with the ballet recital. It doesn't matter what it is. It just has to be something you truly care about. And it connects you to that other person. Exactly. Stephen is asking if we can share the source of this. Uh, yes, we absolutely can. And it came from it came from something that I have a um, a subscription to, and so it might be subscription based. And what was am that? I am I allowed to copy and paste it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. The whole thing? Sure. Why not? Okay. Yeah. yeah it's, not gonna, it's, not he's, it's not that long. He's going to copy and paste. Uh, and uh, yeah, this may have come. This either came from the New York Times. Or Harvard Business uh, Review. I'm it was sorry. it was a Harvard Business. Uh, was it? Yeah, I did say yeah. HBR. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I don't know. It's it's not it's not like okay. Yeah. So it's a Harvard Business Review article. It's kind of the top uh, subject. Oh, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, actually uh, say. Leading with compassion has research backed benefits. You know what? I'll do the title and the authors. How's that? There you go. Google from there. There you there go. There you go. Okay. You, so go. you you can find it with that. Uh, Carol also is, and, and you know, Carol's example that, that she brought up, I think is so typical of what we sometimes can see. She said, someone at work, I had disagreements with them. They're having some medical issues, said their father was having a test on a certain date. And Carol made a note of it. I think that gets to the point that we said, sometimes you have to be intentional. Carol made a note of it. She went back and she asked the person about it and completely turned around their relationship. That doesn't surprise me one bit. That's exactly the kind of thing that I would expect uh, when people yeah. say, gosh, I really didn't, I really didn't know you cared. Right. And, yeah. and, and there's an example because Carol legitimately cared. Now yeah. she knew she might have got busy with life and might have forgotten about it, which is why she wrote a note to herself. Yeah. Right. So there's the idea of being purposeful, <laughs> but still yeah. being legit and, and authentic. Yeah. 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 And I mean, sometimes literally to your point, Sanjay, uh, you have to schedule it even. Yeah, I, I yeah. tell leaders that all the time. If they, well, I get too busy and I forget, and I don't, then you know, put it in your calendar. It's a priority, so make it a priority. My, so my, put it in your calendar. My my grade eleven English teacher, and for the Americans, my eleventh grade English teacher, um, she used to say, "A short pencil is a lot more effective than a long memory." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I like that. There yeah. you go. All right. Uh, next one was find common ground, which again we were kind of alluding to around being purposeful. Yeah. So. Again, if you don't care, don't go there. If right. you, and, and if yeah. you do care, but they don't care, don't go there. If you care and he or she cares, go there. 
<laughs> not not much more than that, right? Yeah. This Pretty sounds simple. like you you need you want to do an engineering diagram on this. I totally <laughs> do. I need a whiteboard right here. That's uh, yeah. there you go. Um, next one is see it. Uh, and so, that yeah, just celebrating compassion within your organization when you see that bring it to life, bring it to, to others. And especially, I would say, and this is not in the article, this is just Richard saying, bring out the benefits of, of compassion. You know, uh, when, when you see that and uh, then and you're letting people know about compassion, let people know about the, the results thereof, the consequences. Yeah. And, and we know, though, that what gets measured, you know, sure, moves yeah, forward, right? Yeah. So so the idea of highlighting it or, or doing a little article or, a, you know, employee of the month or compassionate right. person of the of the millennium or whatever it is by bringing the behaviors and rewarding them one every thousand years yeah 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 it, it, it's it's a it's a highly competitive uh yeah award yeah um and the next one is and again it, you see that they all kind of overlap and they do feed into another it says elevate um and so the idea of, of bringing helping bring someone up right if they're down and and they're crying you know 45 seconds out of a minute and you can talk to them they can cry 40 seconds out of a minute you've elevated them you you brought them forward mm -hmm. and keep in mind that everyone's at a different level and so it's not a matter of everyone has to leave your office yippy skippy and, and singing kumbaya uh for some people that's not a realistic uh, assumption uh or a realistic stretch goal and for other people's you know that's their that's as low as they go so it's a matter of helping them elevate from where they are moving uh, moving forward uh in terms of feeling connected feeling cared for, feeling heard and understood. One of no, my Jay, favorite that, lines, go ahead, Mike. Sorry, Richard, I was gonna say that reminds me of a Harvard study that I wrote about last year sometime about where they looked to see what was the single biggest predictor of success for future leaders. What was the, the biggest, most important trait? And what they found was that they were positive energizers. Mm -hmm. In other words, they were people that just quite simply made other people feel better about themselves. Yeah, they yeah, were yeah. just, they were encouragers. They listened yeah, genuinely. Yeah. They were supporters. They were elevators. So that's exactly. not elevators, it, you know, like that. It, but, not yeah. lift, yeah, yeah. No, the lift or the Ubers. Lift or upper. Um, yeah, lift or Uber. Uh, wait, yeah. sorry, it, it just reminds me that I, I had an ex-girlfriend in high school who had a sign on her, her parents had a sign on the door that said, all of our visitors bring joy to our lives. Some by coming, others by going. Right, yeah, okay, so. yeah, yeah. And that's well, the lift. One of my test, favorite right? lines, one of my favorite lines in this article says that both compassion and rudeness are contagious. Oh, yeah. And I think it's absolutely true. You know, whatever you bring into the office, whatever you bring into the work environment, that's going to catch on. And so if you have a choice between compassion or rudeness, which one would you rather have? I know which one I'd rather have. And again, you do have a choice. The, the most contagious thing in the world, I think, is, is emotions. When yeah. you're down in the dumps, you can suck the life out of your friends. And yeah. when you're excited about something and they don't want to hear about it, you're going to ram it down their throat and get them as excited as you are. Yeah. Uh, and when you live that, you know, it, it is, it's absolutely contagious, uh, which well, ties this, to the last one, which oh, is, yeah, do the last one. And then the last one, which is know your, know your power. Uh, I mean, you do actually have significant ability to, to affect the people around you, both positively and negatively. We can create that organizational culture. We can set the example for the compassion that we want our people to, you know, to live by and, and move the organization forward. And on that note, you know, all, all of that, all of this, I think ties into the word legacy for me too. Mm -hmm. When in, in my workshops, when I ask people to describe the best boss they've ever had in their life, what do they do? They always tell a story, back to Sun yeah. earlier point. They tell yeah. a story. And they ever talk about the one who had the absolutely the greatest operational efficiency? Yeah, no, no. no. The one who had the best handwriting? No. Yeah. The one who was the most, you know, administratively adept? No, it's always a story. And I would say 98% of the time, it's a story that demonstrated how compassionate they were. And this doesn't just apply to the senior leaders. This applies to all of us. What people are going yeah. to remember about us isn't our bank accounts, isn't what car we drove. It's how compassionate we were with one another, right? All of this, I think, feeds into our ultimate legacy. How yes, we want sir. to be remembered, how we want to be thought of, how we want to be spoken about when people leave the room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, <laughs> that created an, uh, an awkward silence. Mm -hmm. No, I'm just, no, I just, you know, everything that comes from, everything that issues from your mouth, Mike, is just, 
Hey, you know what? You're in a Zen spot, and we don't want to. We don't want to very Zen spot. spot. No, no, no. no, you're yeah, absolutely you're, you're absolutely right. Just a couple of things on uh, from an administrative standpoint. Number one, I hope everyone received the email yesterday that said, "Hey, we think we may have cracked the uh, the code on the uh, having trouble getting in." So I've had a couple of emails. Uh, thank you, Anna. Thank you, Jill. Uh, emails just in the last hour or so saying yes, that seemed to get us in. So. If you didn't get that, if you ever have trouble getting in, look at your reminder email and scroll all the way down. It'll take weeks to do it, but scroll all the way down and click the button that says join webinar. Don't click the re-registration thing or it takes us into a whole other dimension of the universe. And we don't want that to happen. The other thing is you do not want to miss two weeks from today, which is going to be March the 22nd, 2023, when we will be joined by our special guest, Chuck Gallagher, who's going to talk about the ethics of artificial intelligence and organizational culture. So, you know, I mean, we knew this was going to come up. Actually, we won't be here. We're just going to put this into chat GPT <laughs> and see uh, how the whole thing comes. No, that's not what we're going to do. That's, in fact, what we're going to talk with Chuck about. Um, and as, as always, if you found this valuable, we would encourage you to invite other people. Yes. Uh, we are thinking of doubling the price for the webinar, uh, but you want to get them in before we do that. Yeah. Um, the other thing too is if there is a particular topic that you are interested in hearing more about or you are interested in maybe possibly hosting, yes. send Richard an email and we would love to hear from you. And you know, how do, I, how do I get into your chat here? Go. You okay. Chat. Go. Okay. Yeah. Send an email to Richard at contented cows. He's you at typing. And I Stop. promise I won't look oh. so scary two weeks from now. What's good? I, I think we should do a vote on whether I should grow a beard or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know how I would vote, but yeah. Wait, <laughs> a yes? Was that a yes, Richard? Yeah. No, I'm I talking, have a great I'm deal of compassion off. for people who don't grow beards. I'm going to. Uh, Unlike my friend here who could grow one before the time is up, we've only got one minute. Uh, no shave and April. Claudine, what she you. says. Actually says no shave April for all of you. Oh, does that mean I should I, not shave? That. So I should just grow it. <laughs> yeah. Well, folks, this you are always the. Uh, the, the joy to our Wednesday, and so we appreciate you all being here. Not every and Wednesday. Not, not every Wednesday. No. Just how often? Every other just Wednesday. Every, every other Wednesday. Wednesday. And I just I'm think trying to read so these cool shave comments. That Mike was able to be here from Costa Rica, and I hope that some of you enjoyed the little switcheroo that we did at the top yeah. of the hour. Yeah. No, it, we're all American free today. Yeah. We. Nobody's coming from the U.S. today. There you go, folks. Thank you for Gosh. joining us. We will see you every other Wednesday. Okay. Thank bye. you all.